New York and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at The Organic View, or you can contact me directly at June Stoyer on Twitter. Today I'm going to be talking to Gary Ibsen in regards to the wonderful work that he does with a tomato seed bank. For the avid gardener, growing one variety of a particular herb, fruit, or vegetable is never enough. It's always interesting to see the difference in plant growth, production, and finally, the taste of the fruit in your cherished recipe. Especially for culinary enthusiasts, the more varieties you have, the more amazing your dish is, complete with the horticultural biography to entertain your guests, leaving them in awe. What if you found that through the years you had quite the assortment of organic tomato seeds in your collection? This is exactly what happened to Gary Ibsen, who suddenly found himself the keeper of this huge seed bank of organic heirloom tomatoes that began to grow thanks to the contributions of his friends, neighbors, and gardeners around the globe. He founded Tomato Fest Garden Seeds, and Tomato Fest has revitalized the appreciation and desire for true heirloom tomatoes. Gary's belief in sustainable organic farming and seed saving has inspired him to develop and grow heirloom tomato varieties for more than 30 years. He and his partner, Dagma Lacey, are growing more than 600 varieties of certified organic heirloom tomatoes from seeds originally sourced from family farms around the world. Their hands-on tomato production and seed harvest techniques ensure the highest quality product and help ensure that these precious heirloom tomato varieties will be sustained for years to come. In 2008, Gary retired from 18 years of producing the nationally celebrated Carmel Tomato Fest event in Carmel, California. Through their Tomato Fest seed donation program, Tomato Fest Garden Seeds has been donating heirloom tomato seeds to more than 250 urban garden projects, school gardens, community outreach gardens around the United States, India, Africa, Europe, and China. So I'd like to welcome Gary Ibsen to the Organic View. Good afternoon, Gary, and welcome to the show. Hi, June. Thank you very much. Glad to join you. You're welcome. Gary, can you tell us about... Your your background. Did you grow up with a with a garden, and were you really into gardening as a kid, or it was one of those things where it's like, ha, huh, another chore? Actually, I would have loved to have grown up with a garden. I was a, a late bloomer. Um, I was uh, in an orphanage, and an aunt and uncle picked me out of an orphanage at around 12 years old, and uh, they found a piece of property in upstate New York in Westchester County, out in the woods, and they put in a little plot and started doing some gardening, and I fell in love with not only having a home, but having a piece of dirt that would actually grow some food. So that's kind of where I got started. And then I didn't really get into gardening uh, um, as a full-time love and passion until I was an adult. But uh, I would love to have had a family that had a history of gardening. So I just had to pick it up as a as a boy, and then as an adult, I got more and more involved just from the, the passion of growing things and bringing uh, healthy foods to the table from the garden. What were the things that kind of attracted you to gardening as an adult? Well, I got I'm gonna have to, have to immediately focus on the tomatoes. Tomatoes is always something that had my attention because of the diversity in flavors and the colors, and and really the bounty of the harvest was so obvious. Uh, I got locked into being a tomato lover early on, let's say in my my 20s, and in my 30s I was growing more tomatoes in the garden than other items. Uh, And it wasn't until that I discovered heirloom tomatoes, which was uh, oh close to 30 years ago now, and um, that really launched me into the passion of growing certified organic heirloom tomatoes and doing more than a few varieties. I mean, I started out by growing a lot of hybrids the way many gardeners do. I had maybe five or six of my favorite hybrids, 
I didn't know what an heirloom tomato was. And there was a Portuguese farmer down the road who said, Gary, I know your passion for tomatoes. You've got to come on over and see my garden and what I'm growing for heirloom tomatoes. And I didn't know what he was talking about with heirloom tomatoes. And I went over one day, and he took me around and showed off his soil firsthand <laughs> by shoving his arm down into the soil all the way up to the elbow. got my attention. And then um, he wanted to send me home with several starts of different heirloom varieties. I think it was six varieties that year. And I grew them out, and I fell in love. I mean, you, you couldn't stop me after that. Once I tasted those first few tomatoes, then I was lost. I was lost into this uh, moving over the hybrids, and now I'm just going to have heirloom tomatoes in the garden. Now, it's interesting that that is basically what uh, – got you hook, line, and sinker, when I've had friends that don't understand the difference between organic and non-organic, I usually use tomatoes from my garden. And when just the smell of the stem, I mean, it's it's just such a beautiful fragrance. And then on top of that, when you pick a tomato right off the vine and you just slice it, just the smell that jumps right out at you. It's just unbelievable. And when you are introducing organic, delicious tomatoes to somebody that really does not understand the importance or uh, just the delight in organic uh, produce, and then you have them taste an organic tomato as opposed to the the, the bland, um, non-flavor tomatoes that you can find in any supermarket huge huge difference and that usually is what does it what gets them to understand the importance of organic so um you know the fact that you just kind of fell in love head over heels it just it doesn't surprise me you know a lot of it had to do with the the genetics of the heirloom tomatoes the different varieties that came from all over the world but as you made a point of uh, let's uh, paying attention to the the smells of the stems, I go down as far as the smells of the soil. Uh, if you've got a, a rich, lofty, kind of uh, healthy soil that you've been nourishing uh, with as much attention as you would nourish a plant, uh, your smells and your flavors start there. Uh, I get asked quite often about why the flavor of an heirloom tomato. And yes, part of it is the genetics. And a good deal of it is the soil you're growing it in, the medium. And then weather has a lot to do with it and, and how you are uh, watering. And uh, there are different factors that lend to the, the flavors and the tomato and the smells. But the flavors is what launched me. As a matter of fact, that's when after that first year of uh, growing my first crop of heirloom tomatoes, uh, I decided to go ahead and share it. My second harvest, I invited a bunch of chefs and uh, some people who were also in the produce business who were friends. And I said, hey, look, I'm doing a potluck in the backyard, and I would like you to be able to taste some of these heirloom tomatoes that I'm sure that you've never seen before. And so we had a potluck. I think there were 10 varieties of heirlooms that year, and there might have been 50 people in the backyards. And I said to all the chefs, hey, look, you're in the food business. You bring a tomato dish, and then uh, we'll make it a potluck. Bring the kids, because I want the kids in on this tasting too. And then we had our first tomato fest in the backyard featuring 10 varieties and about 50 people. <clears throat> Within a few years, that grew quite quickly to 250 varieties, 2,000 people, and then wow. 3,000 people and 400 varieties. And so it kind of grew as I became, uh, I guess, uncontrollable. I kept saying that I would hold it at 100 varieties. And now, that, you're the type of neighbor I want. And then once I got to 100 varieties, somebody would, sure enough, send me some heirlooms or uh, send me some seeds of some heirlooms that were in their family for a long time. And it's like a, a kid showing up the door without a home. I had to invite him in. And uh, so I started growing these other varieties, and we now have 600. I've grown as much as 800 different varieties. I probably have as many as 800 varieties in the seed bank that we now have. But this is how it it, it grew just by not wanting to uh, uh, ignore worthwhile varieties that other people in different parts of the world have cherished. Many of our varieties got sent to me uh, with seeds tucked to paper napkins or uh, dropped in the bottom of an envelope 
with a two-page handwritten letter of not only the the tomatoes history but the family history and why it was so significant to the family to pass down the seeds so the tomato fest was a great launching mechanism this event to be able to share with tomato lovers as well as chefs and as well as people in the tomato business we had people coming from all over the country for this one day event and it turned out to be quite successful in order to tell a story and also have uh, foods that were based on the tomato and I was trying to promote all experiences of tomato, so I wanted to have the culinary artistry involved in telling the story as much as I wanted to have artists involved in doing artwork of tomatoes to give a, a, complete, a complete experience, a tomato experience, if you will, uh, through the Tomato Fest to as many people as possible in one day. And we've carried that on to our website when we started carrying on the seed business. And... Uh, moving where that is our, our total focus now, of protecting the seeds. You're probably aware, June, that with the heirloom seeds, we've, we've over the last 30 years we've lost maybe 30% of our heirloom varieties okay. because a um, small family farm is bought uh-huh. out by a bigger farm, and bigger oh, yeah. farm says we want you to grow this, and we don't want you to grow what you've grown for several generations. So shove that aside. This is what you're going to grow. Just have your acreage with this particular variety. Well, Small family farms and families have lost a lot of those seeds. So once I got the opportunity to grow out some of these precious varieties that have been around for a long time, it was difficult for me, even if I wanted to cut down on the amount of varieties we were carrying every year and growing out every year, I had a very a great deal of difficulty saying, all right, now, do I let go of this variety? Now, what if somebody else doesn't grow this variety out, then this will disappear as well. And do you have any volunteers, uh, any master gardeners or any garden clubs that will volunteer to grow the seeds that you just don't have the capacity for? You know what, I thought about taking it out to that extent. It's really been, this is a two-person business, and I'm so overwhelmed now with what I have to do with harvesting, uh, growing out and harvesting and managing all of this, that, uh, yes, it would be, of assistance to have master gardeners offer some help in growing these out. Actually, I don't own any land anymore. I I have a relationship with a, a few organic gardeners who have certified organic land, and they've been gardeners for several generations and farmers, and they supply markets with their crop, and they portion off from me uh, uh, different parts of their field that are all certified organic where I get to go ahead and do all my plant trials and do all my growing. I no longer grow for markets and restaurants like I used to. Many years ago, I'd be delivering a variety of tomatoes to uh, different stores, you know, like Whole Foods when they were just getting started with uh, heirloom tomatoes and, and other uh, uh, people who really seemed to care about getting the, the customer good uh, produce. And what was uh, that like? Uh, it was interesting in starting out because when I first brought heirloom tomatoes to the market, this was in the mid-'80s, most people did not ever see a black, a purple, a fluted tomato, a yellow tomato, a striped tomato. And so I was bringing all these unusual varieties to the marketplace, and I invariably would get called at home from the produce manager of one shop or another saying, hey, Gary, I can't move these tomatoes. Nobody's buying this tomato. They say it's too ugly. And I would say, all right, <clears throat> Set me up a table by the front door. I'll be over in about 10 minutes and give me a cutting board and give me a space, and I will show your customers uh, by way of taste what these tomatoes were all about. And I, so I built local markets uh, by having tastings, as many as I could possibly do, to people who would come in and have the habit of buying a hard tomato that was a hybrid and something that wasn't grown uh and was not ripe tomato, wasn't picked by and ripened, I would uh, show them the alternative of what their life could enjoy (laughs) if they had an heirloom tomato that really had taste. What real food looks like. (laughs) Yes, what real food was like. And so through the tasting opportunity, uh, I went from one market to another to another market. I'd spend weekends uh, out just tasting and talking to people. I used to love it when I'd have... uh, Moms bringing their kids into the grocery store and come up to the tasting table and come up, 
come to the table with young Billy and says, oh, Billy doesn't like tomatoes. I said, I tell you what, hey, Billy, try this. And I'd cut off a cherry tomato that had a little bit more of a sweeter taste to it, but definitely a lot of flavor. And Billy would be courageous enough to try a, a small gold cherry tomato that had been split in half and put it in his mouth, and his eyes would get really big. And I'd see his face go into a wow expression. And that's what the children had not experienced. They would not experienced a tomato that really had a bursting uh, of flavor, the benefit of all that experience. And uh, so what I tried to do was bring children to this experience as much as bring their parents to this experience of having flavorful, organically grown heirloom tomatoes that would enhance their life with all this diversity. Gary, I have have to tell you, I'm falling in love right as I listen to you. You're a man after my own heart. Hey, it's a good place to fall in love. (laughs) The way that you communicate is exactly um, what my good food friend Dennis Weaver does when he uh, works with children. And, and you know, their families, doesn't matter if they're little kids or teenagers, he does the same exact thing. I do the same exact thing when I'm working with children or teenagers that are there with their parents. The parents are just like, yeah, you know, I've seen this before. But you reach the children, and when you gave that cherry tomato to that little boy, and he tasted what a real tomato tastes like. It's the world of difference. There's no more fighting with, you know, Billy, can you finish your vegetables? He's willing to eat it because it tastes good. You're and that is, yeah. that's exactly what is wrong with uh, what people are doing when uh, it, it comes to uh, making their choices with produce. Um, I personally do not buy tomatoes off season. I don't see the point. I would rather have a tomato that is from my garden. And, you know, there's nothing like the smell of a tomato that's right off the vine, right from your garden. And, uh, you know, I I look at it this way. If I'm buying something uh, in the store, I know it's not going to be the same quality. I'm right there with you. especially Especially if it's off season, you know, it's your your point that you made before about these flavorless tomatoes, how, how consumers are so accustomed to buying these tomatoes that are rock hard, and they taste like cardboard. There's nothing there. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been out, and I'll get a salad. They have these you know, big chunks of tomatoes, and I'll pick them out, and my friends will look at me like, you know, what's your problem? You know, I thought, you know, don't you like vegetables? and it just won't touch it. What's the point? There was a prominent uh, produce chain. All of us know their name. They're really big around the country now. And when I was introducing heirloom tomatoes to the market and their markets, um, they came up to me and said, hey, look, you know, the heirloom tomatoes is, is our best-selling item throughout the summer, these heirloom tomatoes that you're bringing to market. <laughs> and now that the season's coming to a close, what are you going to do to help us through the winter? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we've got to have these heirloom tomatoes here through the winter and the rest of the year. Uh, our customers want them. I said, wait a minute. Let your customers do without. Uh, just just like uh, people having an expectation when the Beaujolais comes to town, you want to have people to go through the seasonal yearning of when tomato season might happen again instead of having them have to have an inferior tomato at the at the season when it is not tomato season and having them get tomatoes that are shipped in from Mexico or having a tomato that, that does not offer all the benefits and the pleasures of having these tomatoes that you're falling in love with here in your store. Uh, and they were not as happy with that. They had to have tomatoes uh, throughout the year. And what happened was that they were now bringing their customers uh, a tomato with the same name, heirloom tomato, but then the tomato came with no flavor because it was ripening on the shelves. It was it was shipped green, and it was shipped from far off places, and it arrived as a hard, tasteless tomato. I would have people that would call me up at home in, in February and say, "Hey Gary, I just tasted some of your heirloom tomatoes, and they're just terrible. What's going on?" I said, "They're not my tomatoes. They are tomatoes from far away. Why don't you wait until June?" <laughs> so my know, favorite the, month of the year. 
Yeah, so it was it was very difficult. Uh, the the need to market uh, a product that everybody loves and to make money on it is really strong, and it it unfortunately it, it does a lot of damage to um, people having fallen in love with a name like heirloom tomatoes, and then all of a sudden now they've got to look at there are different kinds of heirloom tomatoes depending upon who's growing them and who's uh, getting them to you. Um, now, if you're, you're talk- going to buy. If you're going to buy seeds, Gary, what do you advise people? As far as uh, what, what, how should they go about selecting seeds? Uh, Because I mean, this is the time of the year when people are beginning to place orders for their seeds, or even starting to, uh, in some some zones, actually uh, start their seeds. Uh, What do you recommend? When you have, when, when you're advising people as far as how to shop for tomato seeds, uh, what should they look for on the package, and what information should they should they specifically uh, demand when they're buying seeds? That's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, in, in sourcing your seed supplier, I would tend to go to a supplier where you know that they handle organic products, organic seed. There's no reason why you can get organic seed, all the seeds you want, and uh, and have organic seed instead of uh, seeds that are not organic. Then also to have a seed supplier where you know something about the people and where they're getting their seeds. Now, we pride ourselves in the fact that every seed that we share, every seed that we store uh, is seed that we've harvested ourselves, we've grown ourselves, and we pick the fruit, we taste it, we write notes, and, and we know how the seed is treated from the time it's harvested all the way to the time it gets to the customer. So have, knowing something about your your seed supplier is really important. Um, I do get a lot of people, um, I have maybe, oh, we have maybe 20,000 uh, customers from around the world, uh, and we work out of one bedroom in our home uh, off the computer in sharing our seed and our seed information. So I get 200 emails a day every day from gardeners around the world and many people who are first-time gardeners saying, what should I grow? I live here. So similar to your question, I get these questions in all varieties. And and some people said, I have only room for five plants. I live in Manhattan. I live on the top of a building, and I've got a little piece of soil that I've managed to create here. I want to grow five plants. What should I grow? Almost all the time, I try to steer people toward variety. So they have not only experience of a red tomato, but they have a, a bursting in flavor of a small cherry tomato and something a little bit on the sweeter side of a, a yellow or striped tomato. I try to aim people toward diversity, and um, I try to expand uh, their limits. If somebody says, well, I think I'd like to only do this because I want to do something else with the rest of the garden space, I will still try to squeeze in a few more tomatoes for them um, so that they can share the bounty with friends. Invariably, I get people who uh, are passing these seeds on to their children, and this is what I try to do. Doc and I really try to encourage seed saving and passing on the heirlooms from family member to family member. You talked about children a little while ago, and and one of the things I've delighted on the most is that, like in the Tomato Fest, I've had uh, parents who are bringing their children to the Tomato Fest where the, they were children when they first came and helped set oh, up the nice. tomato tastings. So okay. I've had the opportunity to see it in generations. I've gone and visited schools where we've supported many school gardens and urban gardens around the country, even, in fact, around the world, and I go to different schools and talk to children, and then I end up uh, finding these children coming to me who are now teachers, who are now parents, and bringing their children for their first uh, organic tomato experience uh, of of coming to a tasting that they might not have had an opportunity to have somewhere else. So reaching children with this message of uh, healthful food and organics and seed saving and and how to have the pleasures of enjoying the best food you could possibly get is, is really important. It's important to all of us. Now, when you're trying to um, when, when you're trying to save your own seeds, do you have any particular <laughs> method that you suggest to people when they're drawing out their seeds? When you mean when in the seed saving process? Yes. Uh, it's really pretty easy. Uh, 
I mean, on our website, tomatofest.com, you'll see pictures of me bent over a bucket and uh, Doc and I standing in front of 255 gallon buckets, each containing a different variety, and pouring garden hoses into it and going through the rinsing process. But it's easy for anybody to do at a, a home level just by squeezing a half of a tomato into, let's say, a deli type plastic container would be good. And then letting that juice and the seed and the pulp ferment, and it'll get stinky over the next three or four days, and you let it get stinky and moldy. And then you put it under the faucet, and you pour off that top mold, and you rinse it several times to where the the golden good seeds fall to the bottom, it's just like panning for gold. And you uh, have a, uh, what is left over is clean water and gold seeds on the corner of the container or the bucket if you're doing larger amounts. And then that rinsing process, though, if you're doing larger amounts, can be uh, quite an effort, um, tipping and filling and tipping you know, and filling until you end up with the clean seeds. And then we pour it into a, a strainer and then pour that out into a tin and then let it uh, dry for several days and then we, dry it uh, on newspaper? package it up. Pardon me? Do you dry it on newspaper? No, I don't dry anything on newspaper. I, I use... Uh, um, Aluminum, like the baking pans that you would get at Costco, these mm -hmm. really inexpensive cooking pans, and uh, put them in aluminum pans and uh, just let them dry there in open air or in a, a room with fans. We happen to have a couple of uh, storage lockers that we turn into drying rooms, <clears throat> and we have fans and very moderate heat. And uh, I'm up there at all hours of night stirring with my finger all the seeds so they don't end up sprouting, that they stay drying in the air. Um, but it's an easy process for anybody to do. So I get people who will be in different parts of the world, from Russia or China or Brazil, uh, telling me their uh, family story and say, can I send you some of our seeds and this is the characteristic and this is why our family has grown it. We'd like to share it with you. And they send me some seeds in an envelope and we grow them out. So anybody can do it. The way that I was taught was to take, um, whether it's tomatoes, cucumbers, anything where you wanted to save the seeds, and um, uh, sometimes I would rinse them, sometimes I would just um, let them dry on newspaper and then pick off the pulp and whatnot. Um, but I didn't take the extra step to rinse that off um, and uh, then basically what I would do is uh, store it usually in a plastic bag or something and then uh, label them and put them in coffee cans. Mm -hmm. I, use and, Ziploc, I use Ziploc bags. So, so I put them in Ziploc bags and store them in a cool, uh, dry, dark environment. But uh, coffee cans work great or jars work great. Some people use their freezer to store the seeds. To me, you that can would freeze be very, the seeds? Some people will freeze the seeds, yeah. And then it doesn't it doesn't damage the <coughs> propagation of the seed when it's no, springtime. No, doesn't seem to. I mean, oh, you go through you go through winters out there in Connecticut and New York. Same thing. If the seed is on the ground, and it'll freeze on the surface, and next spring it comes up all by itself. Now we had a question from one of our audience members, uh, from Anita. She wanted to know, what do you do if by accident your seeds get wet before it's time to plant? Can you do oh, anything about that, or is it basically a batch that's shot? Uh, in other words, like in the, the package got wet, the seeds you yes. stored and they got wet. Yes. That's a problem because uh, that could that could really damage the viability of the seed. Um, so if, if my seed got wet like that before I was ready to plant, I'd toss them out. I never have gone ahead and tried to dry them out again because invariably that wetness, and if it's uh, the least bit warm, they're going to start sprouting. And I didn't want to take a chance of that. So I would start all over with dried seed. However, if that's the only seed you have, um, you might just try uh, dry them out again and see if you can get them to uh, germinate when you actually plant them. Thank you. And our next question, this is from Sal. He'd like to know, are there any other varieties other than the Roma tomatoes that are suited for canning? Oh, hundreds. Um, I, I use, <laughs> hundreds? I don't, see, I don't, I don't take the standard that in order to can a tomato, it has to be a Roma. So I'll, I'll, there's a variety of, there's a lot of varieties of tomatoes that can be canned well 
of small reds and even different colors. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily just stick to the Romas, even though you get some great varieties like San Marzano Redorta, which is a little bit bigger than your your uh, standard San Marzano or Roma uh, that is great for canning. But uh, there are also some very good, uh, highly acidic, uh, tomatoes that aren't romas, that are just small fruited varieties that are good for canning as well. Um, people would ask me too about the uh, uh, using what tomatoes for uh, sauces, and most people I think are in the habits of having to have a paste tomato in order to create a sauce. Well, I'll, I'll include paste tomatoes, but I'll include paste tomatoes of different colors. I'll make different colored sauces, and then I'll also combine other varieties in with some of those taste uh, paste tomatoes just for uh, flavor additives. Uh, I might take a, a striped tomato or a favorite yellow tomato and add them into my sauce just to add complexity to the flavor. So canning tomatoes and paste tomatoes uh, for making sauce, I'm a little bit looser than the strict definition of what should be a canning tomato or what should be a, a, a sauce tomato. I see. Um now, what exactly is a, a paste tomato? Because that's something that I haven't heard of. Paste, P-A-S-T-E. Oh no, no, I know what it, I know what tomato paste is, but uh, what constitutes? Uh, I would say it's like a Roma tomato, but it's a tomato with uh, that is very thick and meaty, and very little juice, and uh, most often few seeds, uh, so they lend themselves to a, a thicker sauce without having to. Uh, cook down a lot of the juices that you would have if you had uh, varieties with uh, with more liquid in the tomato. Now, would that be the same type of tomato that would be used for, say, to make something like ketchup? Uh, yes. Yes, indeed. People tend to forget that ketchup is made from tomatoes. They just kind of take for, example, take for granted that even though it's the most uh, most used condiment, uh, it is, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of work that goes into tomato and in, into ketchup, and um, you know, the the quality of the tomato really does make the difference. Um, I've had, I, I've tasted organic uh, ketchup at some of the trade shows, and it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, and it's nice to see that there are more and more companies that are starting to manufacture it. Now, a uh, quick question for you: What do you recommend? Which variety or or which varieties do you recommend if people are looking to grow tomatoes that they can dehydrate and use in salads? Oh, those those are two different things: dehydrate and use in salads. Well, the uh, the, the uh, with uh, um, with some of the um, different salad bars and whatnot, you see a lot of dehydrated tomatoes. Uh, you know, you have your options, yeah. the fresh tomatoes and the dehydrated, but it seems as though the dehydrated tomatoes have become a staple, um, along with croutons and other toppings and whatnot. So uh, just out of curiosity, is there a specific tomato that uh, could be grown for the sole purpose of dehydrating it and then inevitably using it as a topping in your salad? No, it's, I really don't think there's a specific kind. Uh, I think you can dehydrate any tomato and end up with that wonderful flavor. Um, uh, it would just be a variety of different flavors. As far as varieties for, for salads, uh, one of the things I used to suggest to people when they'd come to the marketplace and I'm there tasting tomatoes with them is saying, look, you want to have a salad that is filled with experience for your guests and your family. So I suggest you pick different varieties of tomatoes with different colors and different flavors inherent in each one and combine them together. Cut them all up and you have a very colorful salad of mixed varieties and mixed experiences. And the same thing if you're going to be drying your tomatoes. I've got friends that will dry tomatoes of all different types and end up with that condensed characteristic, that wonderful characteristic of a dried tomato that is um, now ready for enjoying at any season if they package it up and uh, uh, use it in their sauces or their salads for that condensed flavor. Uh, did I answer your, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but no, I think you I did. No, you did. You did. Okay. I understand. Uh, next question is, can you freeze tomatoes? Oh, yeah. You can freeze tomatoes and you can freeze a sauce. I mean, I, I frankly, uh, uh, if I, 
I have so many tomatoes, and I I do I do sauce to where my walls bleed. That's how much <laughs> sauce I do. Uh, literally, uh, have white walls, and if I'm cooking all night, uh, two big pots on the stove at harvest season, <clears throat> and it's uh, cooking for several hours during the night. And I occasionally look up and I see the moisture condensing on the walls and streams of red running down. Doesn't make it very happy for my wife, um, but uh, <laughs> the experience of Freezing uh, sauces and freezing tomatoes whole is a good one because you can capture all that flavor. So if I don't have enough time to do more sauces, I'll take uh, big Ziploc bags with tomatoes that I've either uh, blanched and taken the peels off or Mm -hmm. just put in whole in the uh, gallon Ziploc bags and I'd freeze them. And I can take that out in two or three months and I still have captured almost all of that flavor. That's all I care about. And I'm a, a, uh, an advocate of uh, freezing. Canning and freezing, I'm right there with you um, because it captures the flavors of where I can enjoy these tomatoes on these off-seasons. That's the best experience for having a, a flavorful tomato off-season instead of going with the hybrid from Mexico uh, that you can enjoy it from your own freezer or pulling it off your shelves that you've canned the tomato. Now, have you made any tomato vinegar or any other types of, uh, whether it, it's, it's, a, it's a tomato juice or anything like that? I've done tomato juice, and uh, I've not done tomato vinegars. It's all I can do with uh, keeping up with tomato sauces, because um, <laughs> I, I really will have five or six different colored sauces uh, that I can or freeze. Uh, black purple sauce made out of five or six varieties of black purple varieties of tomatoes. And I'll have a yellow sauce that will be softer and sweeter. I might use with some fish dishes that I create. And I'll have uh, a variety that I call, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, I don't call it a Heinz 57, but something kind of <laughs> like that where I might have six or seven different varieties of different colors all thrown in together and so for that flavor. So, Having different flavored sauces and different colorful sauces is something that's been a family uh, treat for us for a long time. Now, do the colors have a significant or indicate a significant type of flavor? For example, are there certain colors that um, are more likely to be more acidic or more sweet, um, so on and so forth? Yeah, there are general characteristics. You're speaking of the tomatoes themselves. Um, yeah. Yes. So generally, your your bigger, more acidic flavors, your well-rounded, big, blustery tomato flavors are your reds, purples, blacks. I, I I'm a real lover of some of the the Russian black tomatoes that are out there for some of the real deep, complex flavors. Your your pinks might be not quite as forward with their acid. They might be on a little bit more toward the sweeter levels. The yellows, the whites, the stripes. Uh, you can have all different kinds of flavors, but they'll, they can push toward appearing to be sweeter, uh, higher in the, sh- uh, the sugars to kind of balance off that acid. So there are general characteristics there. I, I have people that write and say, Gary, why don't you, you've got all these other collections for kids and for people doing sauces. What about a tomato for people who can't take high acid? How about a low acid tomato collection? Well, that, I might do that someday, but that's a lot more difficult because most of the, even the sweeter tasting tomatoes, like the yellows and the whites, they uh, will taste sweeter, but they really still do have a fair amount of the acid in there. Um, now, a white tomato isn't that? It's it's basically an albino tomato. Well, it's not really white. It's close to it's creamy white. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's and actually, actually an albino yeah, tomato. Like white beauty, it's a wonderful tomato. It's a luscious flavor. Uh, it's a you're walking through the tomato fields and and putting that up to your mouth and biting on that is a great experience. So this is one of my best experiences of being a tomato farmer, where I can be walking down these 250 foot rows of tomatoes of different varieties, and I'll just take a summer afternoon and I'll sit myself down in the dirt and I'll reach up and I'll grab this tomato and I'll grab that tomato and I'm like a kid in the dirt chomping down on these wonderful flavors that have a little bit of heat to them from the summer and a a maximum flavor because of uh, the uh, inherited value of the variety of tomato. 
But the white tomatoes, the yellow tomatoes, they can offer a wonderful treat of a tomato experience that might not be as uh, big and blustery and as forward as some of the highly acidic tomatoes. I do encourage people who have not had any of the purples and any of the black tomatoes to expand your horizons and have that experience because some of these uh, black tomatoes like black crim or black from Tula or even the black cherry are just bursting with big tomato flavors. I have never had a black tomato. Oh, I've I've had yellow tomatoes. I've had all sorts of uh, tomatoes, uh, but I've never uh, had a black tomato. Honestly, I was afraid. Uh, I'll be. <laughs> I was afraid to try it because I thought it might have been some genetically modified uh, creation, and I just kind of steered clear from it. Oh yeah, and actually, that's an experience I got from most people in doing the tastings. Most people were afraid of the black tomato because it just didn't look terribly exciting. It wasn't looking hmm. like the red tomato they're used to. But uh, some of these uh, rich varieties from uh, Russia, um, you know, like Paul Robeson. Now, Paul Robeson uh, is a very famous uh, operatic star and was like an, an emissary of the United States back in the 50s. And Russia named their favorite tomato after him, Paul Robeson. Wow. And it's a beautiful, rich, complex flavor with all kinds of subtle nuances that you don't get in, in very simple uh acidic tomatoes um so some of the black tomatoes uh they're growing in popularity for a very good reason and that's taste so i've been probably one of the uh, most forward folks uh, of, of making sure the black tomatoes were introduced to the market once market people realized they could sell them once people tasted them then they became very popular now let me ask you a question are there any particular zones that a black tomato has to grow in uh, no. Uh, it could be in cooler climates or it can be in warmer climates. Most of these black tomatoes come from typically cooler climates, uh, but uh, they do very well in California in 100-degree weather. I have a, a, a colleague that's in Oregon, and she said that she would love to grow tomatoes, but they have such a short growing season. Uh, so would that be a good variety for Oregon? Yes, it would. I mean, there are several of the black varieties that would do very well in Oregon. As a matter of fact, uh, of the number of different collections that we have, we have a cooler coastal collection, we have a short season collection, and we have patio collection and um, children's collection, collections that would target people from different regions and different interests. But you can get uh, tomatoes growing even in coastal areas, which are some of the roughest to grow tomatoes. Uh, and especially the coastal areas of Oregon versus the inland areas of Oregon, but there are varieties that are well-suited to growing there. It's difficult on some of the larger fruited varieties because they need more sun to make it all the way through the season and get big fruit. Uh, more of the uh, medium-sized varieties or the cherry varieties are immediately available, generally speaking, to being better suited to those climates, but you can get some larger varieties that are suited to colder climates. We even have varieties. We get customers from Alaska, believe it or not, Alaska, uh, that are growing tomatoes, and we send them tomato seeds that are short-growing seasons and uh, try to expand their horizon, saying, yes, you too can grow tomatoes out there in Alaska or on the coast of Oregon. How many days? It might uh, be 50 days, hmm. 51 days. You can get some real short-season varieties. Interesting. I, I personally might be interested in that myself. Um, Gary, I want you to tell our audience about the project that you're working on with the Earth Tainer uh, convertible growing system because I think they will absolutely love the whole concept. Well, a friend of mine who was, used to come to the Tomato Fest a long time ago is uh, involved in the high-tech field. He's a scientist, and he's also a gardener. And he created a, a growing system that he called the Earth Tainer. And uh, this happened a, a number of years ago. We got together and he said, look, there are other container garden systems that people are paying a lot of money out there for, and I won't use any names, that are not really as good as they could be. And he designed something that uh, that would respond to people not having uh, much water or not having good soil available and he's come up with a, a system that we wanted to make available as freeware for information to build their own gardening rather than charging for it. 
So we have it on tomatofest.com. It's called the Earth Tainer 3 now. Three uh, different designs have gone on. And it's designed also for people who have no soil to speak of, uh, apartment dwellers or condo dwellers, as well as people now in uh, uh, places where the soil is terrible in different parts of the world. Uh, we have people growing and using the system in Haiti and Australia and Africa and and different places around the world where they've built these systems. So it's to respond to uh, the environment, uh, environmental needs for conserving water, because more of the water goes toward the roots rather than the runoff, and also it holds in heat better. Uh, so we have this earth tainer system. I'm about to do another press release out on it in the next couple of weeks, um, just to have people who have limited time to take care of a plant that they can have it in a container that will sustain itself better. So it's just a matter of <clears throat> having some information we want to share with the world so they can grow more food for their family in conditions that are not ideal conditions of growing tomatoes. So that's the earth tainer that we have on there as part of our website. So we have ongoing information about it available to folks. Now, it's interesting that um, I, I look at it this way when – if you have a sunny window or if you can get your hands on um, a container and get some uh, even potting soil, if you could grow something in a container on a fire escape. I did that when I lived in the city. And um, I, you know, when you're living in the concrete jungle and you're longing for just a little bit of nature, every little thing helps. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, folks, if you're out there and you live in the heart of the city or if you're living in an area where the soil is just not very good, definitely check out the plans for um, this design because it's it's just one of the best things that you could possibly do for yourself and for your family when you grow your own when you grow your own fruits and vegetables. I mean, it's just <laughs> tremendous. Now, More people are talking about it. And, it's gonna, and it's, it is really useful. It offers some benefit to a lot of people. And I think it's uh, having a story like this available, a service available to people without charging for it, um, really expands the benefit. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, absolutely. Now, um, one of the things that I also wanted to ask you is, in regards to the tomatoes when you're growing them, um, do you practice integrated pest management? Uh, how do you deal with aphids? You know, I really, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I haven't had problems. And, you know, I, I live in a, a pretty good place where we're growing in Central California where we really don't have pest problems. Um, the way I look at it, I have a lot of uh, biodiversity and growing 600 different varieties. So it's not like all one variety that might get hit on by a pest. And people ask me what to do, what do I do about uh, tomato worms and other things. And I said, well, I let them have their share. I, I really have not gone into cardiac arrest about trying to uh, <laughs> capture all the pests or destroy them or to kill them. I figure if I grow a healthy plant, it's less apt to be picked off by pests, and I've done pretty well for 25 years in that philosophy. Uh, so I haven't uh, uh, really had pest difficulties, and uh, I don't have the sufferings of people in Hawaii or some of the people in the southeast that deal with a high humidity and uh, uh, and have more of a white fly problem. But I really haven't faced this difficulty, so I'm not experienced. You have many master gardeners out there probably a lot more experienced than I am in handling that. I typically plant a lot of uh, basil, a lot of oregano, uh, different herbs um, <laughs> that uh, you know are offensive to certain predators, but also will use you know, spray water on them just to get them off the plants. But I also have been very fortunate with my garden. And, um, you know, always have it, – it's funny. Everything else in the garden can die, but the tomatoes, I can always count on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me tell you something. Uh, to have your own fresh tomatoes, there's just nothing like it. Uh, now, you've been talking about this tomato fest throughout this entire program. When is the Tomato Fest this year? Oh. And uh, how do you know, get it? Sorry to say, I, I don't do the Tomato Fest anymore. I did it for 17 years, and my wife and I are exhausted from having to, to do 
all this one day event and it took me 10 months a year to plan for it and do it and i retired from doing the tomato fest three years ago so i don't do it anymore as an event i'll do tomato tastings as small groups of friends now but not for three thousand people um Three thousand people is quite a lot. That was quite a lot. And June, you mentioned something I don't want to let go of uh, because you came up with a good thought. You mentioned you use basil between your yes. plants. Maybe that's one of the reasons I don't have pest difficulties because I plant basil uh, between all my varieties. So I have maybe a dozen different varieties of basil growing all over the field. <laughs> so you might have hit on a good reason why we've diminished our uh, pest difficulties. Yeah, it's it's um it's one of the smartest things that you can do that just makes the most sense. I mean, uh most people will utilize basil with tomatoes to begin with and they're companion plants, so it just kind of makes sense and it's also a very easy solution to dealing with the insect issue, which I know has been a very big concern. It's just that unfortunately most people that are not uh avid gardeners or just have never been taught by anybody uh, that you don't necessarily need uh, to run out, get a chemical, and spray everything because the minute that you start spraying, everything that you're growing is affected by those chemicals. Exactly. So, you know, uh, what I always recommend that people do is contact their local cooperative extension. Uh, most of them have horticultural hotlines. Or you know they'll, they're more than happy to send out information, the fact sheets for the the zone that you're located in, and other information so that you can properly grow and care for tomatoes. Mm-hmm. So that's you know that, that's something that I think everybody should do, especially if you're starting out. Uh, now, um, where can you just tell our audience where they can actually purchase the seed or make a donation to get? some of these wonderful varieties and is there a guide as far as what what seeds are are best suited for different zones I actually I have zone maps of of on on the website tomatofest.com and that's what I suggest anybody does we have a site that provides information about all these varieties regardless whether somebody goes to buy seeds or not and that's the site has been designed as a resource for all of these varieties where people can find out about these characteristics and about these different varieties that have existed as prize varieties around the world. So tomatofest.com has all the information. Yeah, several years back when I used to publish magazines, I decided I was going to stop doing paper. It was a waste of resources and a waste of money sending paper out, uh, paper catalogs, even though I do love my catalogs, the ones that a few I get, but I don't do catalogs anymore. Everything is online at tomatofest.com, and people can go for information as well as they can source different seeds, and they can always write me an email at gary at tomatofest.com, T-O-M-A-T-O-F-E-S-T.com, and I answer all my emails, um, and they can ask me, hey, look, I'm living in this particular region. What might be most suitable for me here if I can only grow? Ten varieties of tomatoes, or six varieties of tomatoes. Um, I'm always willing to help, and I answer emails personally. And don't you have quite a variety here? I'm just looking on the site, and it's just absolutely amazing. Um, wow! Are you? Do you have any intentions of publishing a book about all of your wonderful work? Well, I I did publish a book called The Great Tomato Book. It's out of print right now. It's sold out, and I'm getting ready to do another book. Uh, so I've got another book planned, but right now uh, I've got all I can do uh, with uh, handling communications from folks from all over the country and all over the world with c- tomato questions. Um, it's interesting. I, I got a, a note from somebody in Greece today, uh, as well as yesterday I got one from uh, a gardener in Italy, and they said they wanted to be able to start their neighborhood, uh, uh, get used to different colored tomatoes. They've n- only known one kind of tomato in their region, and they're trying to expose them to different kinds of tomatoes. And uh, I feel like I'm uh, the Pied Piper here, uh, walking around <laughs> with all these varieties of tomatoes and saying, all right, here's something to start with that will get your community loving you uh, and cherishing the new flavors you bring to them. So there are all kinds of opportunities by, just by going to the website. It might be overwhelming for most people to see this many tomatoes and this many varieties, but if you have trouble, you can just send me an email and I'll help them out. 
Well, I'm looking at your earth painter, and that's just absolutely beautiful. And, yeah, it does. it really does conserve space. Now, I have to ask you this. Those, <laughs> I, I've actually been quite surprised to see how many of them uh, have been appearing throughout New York, but those containers that hang up, hang upside down where you're supposed to basically put the seeds in there, uh, water it, I, I guess, once a month, <laughs> and it's supposed to produce these big, beautiful beef steak tomatoes. Yeah, I find it a marketing gimmick. Uh, I, I yeah, just, I do too. I'm <laughs> not attracted to it. And some people will go for anything that will give them an easier tomato to grow, but it's not necessarily the easiest way to go at all. There are gimmicks out there, and uh, I think there's nothing like growing a tomato uh, from the ground up <laughs> rather than from the sky down. Um, yeah, I, I just uh, it, it's just mesmerizing when you when you're driving and you happen to see these things uh, either uh, you know somebody's backyard or even their front yard, and you just think to yourself, my goodness, uh, they definitely need to check out tomatofest.com. June, when my children were small, I used to uh, encumber them with uh, tomatoes that I grew totally around the house, tied up to the eaves, the gutters of the roof. Mm -hmm. So I would plant them all around the house and tie them all up to the gutters. So the house was surrounded by tomatoes. You couldn't look out a window. The kids had to go through tomatoes to open their window. Um, You can grow tomatoes anywhere if you have the right kind of uh, pot or the right kind of soil available to you and the right kind of protection. I encourage people to be brave. Tomatoes are, are pretty forgiving. Yes, that they are. That's an excellent, excellent point. Now, just a quick question for you. When you are staking your tomatoes, what method do you recommend? And what what resources do you tend to use? I I actually try to use uh, pantyhose when I'm tying them. I I cut them up into strips because I find that it helps uh, the plant to breathe. But I know some people will use anything from the twisty ties to rope. And I think all of that is good. I have never used the pantyhose method, but I've, I've had friends that have used it. And uh, it's I'm a girl thing. Anything that works, yeah. Um, you know, I, I use a whole different method now than I used to. When I was only growing uh, 60 or 70 plants, I'd tie every stem with twisty ties around the stem and then tie them up to either a pole or some kind of support. I used to do the cages where you'd have the concrete wire you can buy in hardware stores. Oh, yeah. And I'd make three-foot rounds that would stand eight foot tall and put it around each plant. But now that I'm doing many thousands of plants, I think I'm growing close to 18,000 plants each year now. Uh, Now I do them in rows, and I stake every eight feet, and I make 250-foot rows, and I tie the plant uh, around the posts and go from one end of the row and then back the other side and then every every 12 inches high higher I will tie run another line and tie the plants that way so I, they don't get as much individual stem uh, attention like I used to when I had more time um, but the cage system works fine and also uh, creating uh, uh, stakes and tying plants up to uh, uh, poles that are higher up um, that works well too. And what do you use as far as uh, the poles? Do you just use uh, any branches from, you know, uh, you know pruning uh, or? Yeah, I would use wood branches or I use metal stakes. Uh, whatever you happen to have available that will offer some weight support. Some of these uh, flimsy little cage systems that they've got out there in the marketplace that are uh, soldered together pieces of aluminum that go in mm. circles. I don't see how they can support a healthy tomato plant that has much weight in tomatoes. Um, so I, I'm one for creating something that's a little bit sturdier to uh, handle what you will optimistically hope will be a 20 pound of tomatoes growing off a plant. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's why, you know, use what you have, folks. I couldn't agree with you more, Gary. And, you know, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been absolutely wonderful learning about all the things that you do with Tomato Fest and just a, a wealth of knowledge about tomatoes. Thank you very much, June. I encourage all your listeners to try tomato saving, uh, seed saving so they can do it for themselves and experience the, the pleasure of uh, continuing that tradition of saving seeds. 
Thank you. And, folks, this has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon. And don't forget, check out Gary's site, tomatofest.com.